Hi everyone, welcome back to day 10. I'm losing track here, that's awesome. Uh, day 10 of introductory physics. Um, and as I was just saying before I started the recording, we are done with chapter four. Chapter four was a big review of Newton's laws of motion. And um, so today we're gonna build off of that and apply Newton's laws in a couple different scenarios. So we're going to be spending the next couple of days in chapter five, um, just thinking through how we can apply his three laws of motion to various real life scenarios and what the mathematics of that looks like, especially with his second law. Um, his first law and his third law do kind of like tie into that really nicely. Um, but his second law is really the main equation that we'll be thinking about for the next few days. All right, so I want to start off with a quick uh, kind of review of the things that we talked about yesterday. Um, so take a moment, think through these questions. Is there a net force on a car driving down the highway at a constant speed? Is there a net force on a baseball in flight? Is there a net force on you right now? And is there a net force on a car driving at a constant speed around a roundabout? Um, so that like, circle thing that you drive around in the road that's a roundabout uh, so take just a moment and think through these questions and i'll check back with you in about 30 seconds so is there a net force on a car driving down the highway at a constant speed no there is not a net force but there are forces acting on the car what would be some of the forces acting on the car in that case Gravity for sure is one. Drag, yeah, if we're um, considering air resistance and that sort of thing, absolutely. Uh, normal force, good. The normal force of the road holding up the car. Friction between the tires and uh, the road, that's good. Um, the engine force, yeah, so that force like pushing the car forward from the engine. Good, yeah, all kinds of forces acting on this car but if they all add up to zero, then there's no net force. So um, if there's not an acceleration, then there's not a net force. So since we see in that scenario, it's moving at a constant speed, that means there's no acceleration, so there's no net force. Is there net force on a baseball in flight? Yes, gravity is pulling that ball back down towards the ground, um, so that would be the net force. Is there a net force on you right now? I mean, I can't see you guys, um, so I don't know for sure, but probably not. Probably you're sitting in a chair somewhere or on your bed or the floor or something like that. Uh, so gravity's pulling you down and whatever you're sitting on is holding you up um, and those would cancel each other out. They'd be balanced, um, equal and opposite. And is there a net force on a car driving at a constant speed around a roundabout Yes, there is, because there is an acceleration. Remember, changing direction counts as an acceleration, even if the speed is staying the same. Velocity is a vector, so it has both components, both magnitude and direction. And if either of those change, then you have an acceleration. Right, centripetal force, good. And we'll talk about the difference between centripetal and centrifugal force um, in about a week or so. Uh, great. Okay. Question, is quantum mechanics part of physics or is it something else entirely? It is part of physics, but not physics one. Thank goodness. All right, next question, again, based on Newton's laws that we talked about yesterday. You push the gas pedal and accelerate in your car at a green light. Your car has a mass of 1,200 kilograms and your acceleration is 4.5 meters per second squared. So two parts to this question. Part A, identify an interaction pair, action force, reaction force, and result in this scenario like you were doing yesterday. And part B, what is the net force on your car? So take a couple of minutes, think through these questions, and then we'll join back together. 
All right, let's go through this, uh, these couple questions together. So for part A, I just said that there are several different possibilities and I wanted to hear from you guys what uh, interaction pairs you chose to uh, consider. So type in the chat, what are some interaction pairs that you found in this scenario? Kobe, you said my foot and the gas pedal. That's a great interaction pair, right? So um, your foot and the gas pedal, your foot pushes the gas pedal down, that's the action force. The reaction force would be the pedal pushing back up on your foot, and then the result would be your car goes forward. Another one, car against the road and the road against the car. Yeah, absolutely, right? The car is pushing down on the road, that's the action force. The reaction force is the road pushing back up on the car. Same size force, just opposite direction. And the result is that your car does not plunge to the center of the earth, thankfully. Engine action force, car or other parts, the reaction force. Okay, good, yeah, absolutely. Um, so great, we can see in every scenario, there's probably multiple uh, interaction pairs that you could choose. You just want to make sure that when you're identifying the action force and the reaction force, that they are um, about your interaction pair. So, for example, if our interaction pair was the gas pedal in my foot, we wouldn't say the action force is the car sitting on the road, because the road has nothing to do with that specific interaction pair of your foot and the pedal. Right? So keep those things in mind. Um, there are always multiple answers for these, but you have to make sure that you stay specific to just two objects interacting with each other. Um, ooh, one more, good one, Colby. The car rushing through the air and the particles within, it, within the air slowing it down, right? So the car is hitting these air par particles. Oh my goodness, I can't speak today. Um, and the air particles are hitting the car back, right? Action, reaction. Okay. So what is the net force on your car? We're gonna use the net force equals mass times acceleration. So we take the mass, multiply it by the acceleration, and we get a force of 5,400 Newtons. So a lot of people would say like, oh, this isn't real physics. It's just plug and chug numbers. And there is some truth to that. Uh, what we're doing here is, is not really anything super complicated, uh, but physics isn't always super complicated. Sometimes it is just a matter of getting these things straight in our head. Um, but I will say from here on, the examples might get a little bit more complicated. Um, I do have some practice problems for you though. I tried to post them on Canvas before class, but my internet was being a little um, sketchy. We've had a lot of power surges here because of storms and stuff like that. Um, so I'll try again after class, but I'll have some um, F equals MA type questions for you on Canvas if you want some practice thinking through those. All right, so as we go through these next couple of examples, uh, some things for you to keep in mind are that objects can be moving in two dimensions at the same time. Um, right, just like we saw in projectile motion, it can be moving both up and down and side to side at the same time. Um, and then Newton's laws will still apply right, even in that scenario, even if it's projectile motion flying through the air. But we do have to be a little bit more careful with that kind of scenario um, because again, we have to look at our horizontal forces and our vertical forces separate from each other, just like we did in projectile motion last week. So we're gonna break problems down into their components, their X components and their Y components, and then analyze them separately. So we take Newton's second law, and uh, it holds for both the X direction and the Y direction. Uh, it's equally valid in both cases. So our net force in the X direction is our mass times our acceleration in the x direction. And our net force in the y direction is our mass times our acceleration in the y direction. 
the mass is going to be the same, right? It's not a different mass if you're jumping up and down versus jumping sideways. Um, so mass doesn't change, but we will have to think about acceleration in those specific directions and forces in those specific directions. And then of course, too, if we ever have a force that's acting on an angle um, other than horizontal or vertical, then we're going to need to use our trig functions. So remember, SOHCAHTOA to help you figure out whether you're going to be using the sine of the angle or the cosine of the angle. All right, so here's an example. We'll go through this one together. In empty space, I push a 100 kilogram satellite with five newtons of force at an angle of 30 degrees above the x-axis. What is the satellite's acceleration in x and y? So I would always recommend when you do any type of problem in physics that you draw a picture first. That doesn't just apply to projectile motion problems, that applies to any type of problem that you're doing. I really do think it's a valuable skill to help you pull out the important, relevant information from the scenario and help you get it organized in your head before you just jump into equations. So here's our satellite. You know, it's 100 kilograms. I'm gonna set up my coordinate system. Um, so we know we're pushing it with five newtons of force at an angle of 30 degrees above the x-axis. So that's pretty much everything that we know from the scenario. We also know that we're looking for acceleration. Um, but the first thing that we're gonna wanna do, just like we did with projectile motion, uh, whenever we have an a vector on an angle like this, we're gonna wanna break it down into its components. So it's x component and it's y component. So remember the x component is like saying, how far over are we pushing this satellite and how far up are we pushing this satellite? Uh, so we create this nice right triangle there. So let's look at the x direction first. We know from Newton's second law that in the x direction, the net force equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. So remembering SOHCAHTOA, right, here's our angle, and this x component is the one that's adjacent to the angle. So we're going to use ka, the cosine, so five, which is our hypotenuse of the triangle, times the cosine of our angle, 30 degrees, will give us that x component of this force. We know the mass is 100 kilograms, and we're looking for the acceleration. So once we do all that math, we find the acceleration in the x direction is 0 0.043 meters per second squared. Yay! Same deal in the y direction, except uh, this time we're going to be using the sine of our angle because this y component is the side of the triangle that's opposite our angle. Remember, so, S-O-H, sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So our hypotenuse is 5, sine of our angle 30. That will give us a y acceleration of 0 0.025 meters per second squared. Ta-da! If we wanted to, we could find the magnitude of the acceleration by uh, squaring both components and taking the square root, so that Pythagorean theorem deal. Um, and we could, we could do that, but we weren't asked to do that, so let's not. Any questions about this example? See a question here. Do these laws also work in three dimensions? Yes. Um, in theories where extra dimensions exist, uh, that's all I can really say about that. Um, is quantum mechanics another word for particle physics? Sort of. They're related to each other. Um, okay, great. So whenever we like analyze these um, force 
type problems. Uh, there's a specific kind of diagram that physicists like to draw. Those are called free body diagrams. And I actually drew a free body diagram on the previous slide um, for that example. But a uh, free body diagram, also known as an FBD or sometimes called a force diagram, is a picture that shows all of the forces that are acting on an object, including their magnitudes and directions. It is vital that you include their magnitudes and directions because force is a vector and both of those things are essential components of the force. Uh, so we need to include both of those. Basically, it's kind of like a scale diagram of the forces in the scenario. So usually, just for simplicity's sake, uh, we'll draw the object as just a dot or a box um, so that we don't have to like draw out a velociraptor or a pigeon or whatever the question happens to be about. Uh, we'll just draw it as a dot or a box. And then we draw all of the forces as arrows pointing out from that dot or box. Um, so that, that idea of drawing the forces out from the box, I'll illustrate for you um, in one of the following examples. So of course, the length of the arrow shows the size of the force. We want to try to create it to scale as best we can. The direction of the arrow shows the direction that the force is acting. We want to label all of the arrows with the names of the forces so that we keep them straight in our heads. And we want to include all of the forces for each given scenario. So of course, pretty much every scenario that we do is going to involve gravity. Um, some will involve the normal force, some will involve friction, uh, but whatever forces are present, we need to draw all of them into our diagram. If the forces are equal sizes and opposite directions, that means they're balanced, right? Newton's third law, equal and opposite. Um, so that means the net force is zero and there's no acceleration. Um, and if there's no net force, I'm sorry, if there is a net force, then there will be an acceleration. So uh, look for keywords in your scenario, things like constant speed, constant velocity, uh, terminal velocity, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, those sorts of things will give you a clue automatically as to whether or not there's an acceleration and therefore the sizes of your forces. So if we have um, something like sitting on a table at rest, well, if it's at rest, then there's no acceleration. And we should automatically know then that the force of gravity pulling it down is exactly equal to the force, the normal force pushing back up on it. Um, so we can, we can really easily calculate the force of gravity if we know the mass. Um, and from that, we can start piecing together these other forces. Remember as well that an object can be moving and have zero net force. The motion just won't be changing, right? So that's if it's moving at a constant speed, constant velocity, uh, terminal velocity, those sorts of things. Equilibrium, yeah, nice. Um, if my bed were exerting more force on me than I am on it, would I accelerate upwards? Yes, that's essentially a trampoline. Um, and if you, like if your force of gravity were bigger than the normal force holding you up, you would fall right through your bed. Um, so that'd be fun. Um, okay. So here are gonna be two examples of uh, free body diagrams. One, we're gonna have a hockey puck sitting at rest on ice. And the other, we're gonna have a hockey puck, which is hit to the right while sitting on ice. Um, usually, also, if you see like on ice in a scenario, that means we're ignoring friction. Um, unless we specifically say like, the coefficient of friction for ice is this number that's super close to zero, then you'd have to calculate it. But usually we're gonna be ignoring friction whenever we have something on ice. 
So here's my hockey puck. Again, I'm just gonna represent it as a box for simplicity. We know we're gonna have a force pulling it down and that's the force of gravity. And the ice is gonna be holding it up. That's the normal force. And those two force arrows are equal in length, opposite in direction. So those forces are balanced, which means the net force is zero because they're equal and opposite. If we have a hockey puck that's being hit to the right, we still have the force of gravity pulling it down and the normal force pushing it back up. But now we also have this third force that's going off to the right, and that's our applied force. Uh, we're just calling it a generic applied force, and we'll apply <laughs> that label to any force um, that's kind of like specific to the problem. So if you remember yesterday, we had uh, we went through our list of like our seven most common forces that you'll see gravity, normal force, friction, tension, if there's a string, a wire or something pulling on it, um, air resistance, and then pretty much anything that's not those falls under that applied force category. But in this case, uh, since there's no friction, there's no force acting to the left. On this hockey puck. Uh, we just hit it to the right. So that means there is a net force that's not zero uh, since that applied force is unbalanced. Right? There's no other force to the left that's going to balance it out. So our net force would be whatever magnitude our applied force is. All right, terminal velocity. I, I mentioned that a couple of minutes ago. Um, so in reality, when things are falling, there does come a point where the force of gravity pulling down um, is perfectly balanced by the force of air resistance pushing up. So in chapter three, when we were doing projectile motion, we had always just assumed the ideal case where we were ignoring the effects of air resistance. But with terminal velocity, we can't do that. Terminal velocity is kind of a special case. So in this, since the forces are balanced, that means the net force is zero. And the object stops accelerating. It does not stop moving, it stops accelerating. So the velocity no longer increases. It's still falling down, right? If you, to think back to skydiving, um, if you were skydiving and uh, like, let's say you opened up your parachute, Okay, so you were like floating down to the earth. Um, it, it would be really weird if at some point you just stopped moving and like hovered in midair. Um, so that's not, that's not what happens, right? The object is still moving, it's just not accelerating anymore. It's falling at a constant speed. Um, so since we call, uh, well, since it's no longer accelerating, we call that its terminal velocity, its ending velocity, because it's no longer going to increase from that point. The terminal velocity of an object depends on its mass and surface area, as well as the density of the surrounding fluid. Remember, air is technically a fluid in a physics sense. Um, so the more surface area something has, the slower its terminal velocity. And here are a couple of examples. A raindrop, when it falls out of a cloud, which is about to thunderstorm again <laughs> today, um, so I'll see this very soon. But the terminal velocity of a raindrop is about nine meters per second, or 20 miles per hour. So once it starts falling from the cloud, it'll pick up speed because gravity's pulling it down, until the force of air resistance pushing it back up is equal to the force of gravity pulling it back down. And then it'll continue to fall. However far it falls, it'll continue to fall at nine meters per second. A golf ball flying through the air has a terminal velocity of 32 meters per second or 72 miles per hour. If you're skydiving belly down, which is the safe way to do it, and um, then your terminal velocity is about 60 meters per second or 134 miles per hour. This is before you open your parachute. But if you're skydiving head down, then um, your terminal velocity increases to 330 
miles per hour. That's like the world record um, pace. So that's not. Um, does that mean you do skydive belly down? Yeah, generally when you jump out of the plane, uh, you like jump forward so that you're like belly flopping out of the plane. Um, yeah, it's fun. We'll do some examples um, with terminal velocity. Here will be one, but we'll do some more tomorrow. Um, but anyway, example three. If a skydiver has a mass of 80 kilograms, find the terminal velocity of the skydiver, assuming a force of air resistance of this function, F equals 0.32 V squared. V is our velocity squared. All right, so here's our person, our skydiver. Uh, we know the force of gravity is going to be pulling him slash her down. Um, and if you remember from that big table of forces that we went through yesterday, I listed some of the equations for you. Uh, the equation for the force of gravity is mass times g. And we should remember that g, little g, is 9.8 meters per second squared. So that gives us a force of gravity of 784 newtons downward. Well, we just learned that in terminal velocity, that's where the force of gravity pulling down is exactly balanced by the force of air resistance or drag pushing back up. And we know that our force of drag or force of air resistance is that function. So we need to find at what velocity is our acceleration equal to zero, right? Because at terminal velocity, we are no longer accelerating because there's no net force, because our forces are balanced. So we need to basically solve for V in this situation. Okay, our net force from Newton's second law is mass times acceleration. And I just left off the subscript Y because we only have forces in the Y direction and I was just lazy. Um, so we're only talking about up and down. All right. So we can see our force of drag or air resistance is pushing up, so I called it positive, whereas our force of gravity pulling down is negative. So when we add the forces together, we have to keep in mind their direction. One is up, one is down. So one is positive, one is negative. So when we're adding together with a negative number, it's really like subtraction. Right? Our force of drag minus our force of gravity, that's our net force equals mass times acceleration because of Newton's second law. And we know that equals zero at terminal velocity. Right, our acceleration is zero. So let's plug in what we know. Right? Our force of drag is that function, 0.32 V squared. Our force of gravity is 784 newtons, and that equals zero. So we can set those two things equal to each other. And just continuing down the algebra, divide both sides by 0.32. And we get a velocity of negative 49.5 meters per second. Be careful because your calculator will give you the positive root. It will tell you that velocity is positive 49.5 meters per second. Right? But remember, it's pulling you down. You're falling down. So it's, we want the negative root there. Okay, um, questions about this example. All good? All right. Great. Let's look at another example. Two blocks sit on the floor in contact with each other. Block A has a mass of 10 kilograms and block B has a mass of 15 kilograms. You push block A with a force of 75 newtons, determine all the forces on block A. And by that, I mean their magnitudes and directions, not just which forces are acting on it. That's a good step, but you need to go further than that. So again, always start by drawing a picture. Here's our floor, here's block A and block B. 
And we're pushing on block A with 75 newtons of force. So I'm gonna draw a specific free body diagram now for block A. And that's gonna list all of the forces that are acting on it. Because even in that picture of the scenario that I drew up top there, um, that doesn't actually list all of the forces. That's just illustrating what's happening um, based on the words that we were given. So we have to remember, always we're gonna have the force of gravity pulling it down. Since it's sitting on the surface, we have the normal force holding it up. We're pushing it, um, I said to the right, it didn't specify in the question, um, but I just assumed to the right. And there's gonna be some force from block B pushing back on it because these two blocks are touching each other, right? So if you push block A into block B, block B is gonna push back. Newton's third law. Right? If you punch the wall, the wall is going to punch you back, sort of. Okay. Usually, though, we don't draw those forces like that, pointing at the box. We like to draw them pointing out from the box. That makes it a lot easier to um, keep in mind which forces are positive and which forces are negative. Um, because again, remember, up and right are generally positive, and down and left are generally negative. Although you can change that if it's more convenient in the scenario, um, but that's that's the typical situation. All right, so there I went ahead and labeled the forces in our free body diagram. Gravity pulling down, normal force pushing up, our applied force to the right, which we know is 75 newtons and the force of block B against block A, uh, pushing back to the left. So for our normal force and our force of gravity, we'll use Newton's second law. And this time I did specify that we were referring to the Y direction because we have forces both vertically and horizontally now. Um, so, we know that this block is not accelerating vertically. Right? It's not falling through the floor or being propelled up into the air. It's sitting on the floor. So we have a zero Y acceleration, which is very convenient because then we know that the normal force equals the force of gravity. And we know how to calculate the force of gravity because that's mass times little g. For block A, it's 10, kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, that gives us a force of 98 newtons. So now we know the normal force and the force of gravity are both 98 newtons. One is positive, one is negative, um, but they're the same magnitude. Now we just have to find out what that force of block B on block A is. And we're gonna use both Newton's second and third laws for this. So when we're pushing these blocks, um, they'll have the same acceleration as we push them. Because if they didn't, if the acceleration of block B was bigger, it would end up like racing ahead and away from block A. And if the acceleration of B were smaller than the acceleration of A, then it would have to like phase through block A, like block A would have to pass through block B and block B would be left behind. And that doesn't really make sense. So these two blocks are going to end up with the same acceleration. So we're going to kind of treat them as one mass, one big block. So the total mass then of that big block is 25 kilograms. We know our applied force is 75 newtons. And our, our mass then, our total mass is 25. Um, times our acceleration. So doing that math, we find our acceleration to be three meters per second squared. And um, now thinking about Newton's third law, that means that block A pushes block B with um, 15 times, the mass times our acceleration, 45 Newtons to the right. And block B pushes back on block A with 45 newtons to the left. Those two forces are equal and opposite. Action force, reaction force, 
are um, equal and opposite. So this block is going to end up accelerating, both of them, I guess, at three meters per second squared. What about friction? Marco, that is a great, great question. Um, this scenario doesn't say ignore friction. So I suppose we technically should have considered it, um, or I should have specified ignore friction. Um, I'll teach you guys how to calculate friction tomorrow. We'll do some examples including friction tomorrow. Um, so for now, I guess we'll assume that the floor is made of ice, just so we can ignore friction. All right, do you guys have any questions about these couple examples that we did today? Okay, well, like I said, I know that was a, a quick class today. We'll do some more examples of this tomorrow and some more difficult examples of this tomorrow. Things um, on angles and things involving friction and um, Atwood's machines, if you know what those are, things involving pulleys. Uh, we'll do all those crazy kinds of examples tomorrow. Um, so, if you don't have any questions, then uh, we are done for today. Like I said, I'll be putting up some practice problems on Canvas um, right after class, along with practice drawing free body diagrams. So if you want some practice trying to figure out what forces are acting on an object and in what direction, then check out Canvas um, in about an hour or so, and there will be problems there for you along with solutions uh, so you can check your work. But I hope you guys have a great day and I will see you tomorrow.